All right, episode 41 with Drew Pornell. Drew is a fantastic actor-singer based out of New York City. He owns the show Shades of Buble. He travels all over the world with that show. Uh, we talked about his whole career. Also had Mr. Brian Edwards join me as my co-host, and that's always great when that happens. So sit back, relax, enjoy Drew Pornell. <laughs> All right, we're rolling with Drew Parnell. Nice to have you here, and um, nice to have my co-host Brian Edwards here as well. And uh, Brian's in Peterborough. Drew is currently in Florida. Your main residence is in New York City, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah. And we met uh, a few years, maybe, is it three or four now? It's, maybe it's four Uh like remember. when we met on the cruise, because remember we met there before we met, before I performed at Walter's Theater. Yeah, but here at the theater. At the uh, theater, that was 2000, was it 16 or 17? Yeah. I can't a, remember. It's three or four. Anyways, you yeah. uh, came up and performed uh, with your show Shades of Boobla, which I absolutely loved the show awesome. and uh, did a great job here. And um so how long, let's talk about that show for a little bit. Okay. Uh, and then we'll kind of skip back to uh, the beginning of your career and we'll talk about, about that. But currently Great. you've been touring really all over the world with, with Shades of Buble. And uh, how, how did that all come about? So back in 2015, um, I, we'll probably go back and touch on my other part of my career in a little bit, yeah. but I have been predominantly doing theater work. Um, I did my first kind of concert gig um, that was uh, just like a Broadway concert. And another guy that was in that said he had a friend who was creating this new group, this new show, and he thought I would be perfect for it. So he recommended me, I think some, maybe one or two other people recommended me to the people that created Shades of Buble as well. Um, so I just got an email one day uh, from one of the creators, Ron Stefano, and asking me to come audition. And I think that was in February of 2015. I found out that same exact day I had to do a few songs from the show and all that. So I, I did really well at the audition. I'm not a great auditioner, but um, I did really well that day and found out that night, which never happens. You know, usually you have to wait, at least in the theater world, you have to wait yeah. weeks sometimes. Usually you don't even hear anything. Um, but they called me that night and asked me to do the premiere concert. And we had no idea what it was going to turn into. We filmed our uh, initial concert in April of 2015 and um, got all the promo stuff together and uh, started working a few months later. And it's it's been really amazing. We've been all over the United States, Canada. Um, <laughs> we just did our first Australian tour back in February that got cut a little short with uh, everything happening, but we've also yeah. performed on cruise ships all over the world. Um, so it's just been a really fun and kind of wild few years that I didn't really expect. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For those people who've I've never seen the show before, talk about what, what the show uh, is about. So the initial idea was that, um, you know, there's a lot of guy groups um, that's kind of popular. Like people love to hear the harmony and stuff like that. Um, but the the creators wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, yeah. They knew Michael Bublé was very popular, um, has a lot of uh, hits versus whether it's his pop style songs on the radio or, you know, he kind of uh, made the vintage Frank Sinatra thing popular again as well. Um, so they wanted to kind of combine the two elements of that. And um, with there being three different guys, you could get like nice, tight, three-part harmony. But as, but also you could showcase different sides of Michael Buble because, of course, he writes some songs, but he also covers the Frank Sinatra stuff. He sings some of the uh, pop rock uh, Motown type songs as well. You know, we do an uh, Eagles cover in the show. So... Um, the idea was that there was a little bit of something for everyone. And then the title was a little bit of a play on words uh, with shades of Google. And uh, I guess you could say we're 
showcasing a few different shades of of him within the show. And it's basically it's three guys. Yes. Um because I think most people would probably would think that it's one person mm-hmm. singing. Mm-hmm. But you actually have three guys and it's all choreographed. Um and each guy really has their own solo moments. It's not really right. one lead and you know two backup type people. Right. It's, it's right. a really a mixture. It's a neat neat take on on um really a a tribute i i know brian and i never liked the word tribute too much but it's it you know it's hard to get around it but right. there's certain shows that are a tribute where right. you know you dress up like whoever tim mcgraw and put your cowboy hat on and pretend you're him but you guys aren't that you're you're paying more homage to him or you're really it's his music and, and yes it's a show it's a bit of everything um, yeah that yeah We've started trying to clarify that up front in the show used to, um, you know, we early on in the, the run, we had a couple of uh, spies in the audience, I guess you could say, and they would kind of listen to people at intermission and see what they were saying. And, you know, I think people were like, at first they were like, they don't sound anything like Michael Buble. And that, that wasn't really the point. You know, I, I think the word tribute was throwing it off. Um, but now we make clear that we don't imitate him. We celebrate him and all the yeah. great music that he's uh, done, whether he covered it or um, was part of the writing process. Um, so we're trying to clarify that. But I think you also, it gets tricky, you know, when you use anyone's name in a, a title of anything. So tribute kind of has to be in there just so yeah, people don't think it's it's him, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I remember that night on the cruise, like it was yesterday. And one of the things I do as a promoter, I like to hear what the audience says. I sit out there and listen exactly what they're saying. And I'll tell you something, you captured it bang on because everybody in that audience loved it. They just, awesome. I can, I never forget that. Darren and I talked about that after that you really created that great memory, if you want to call it that, or tribute, whatever you want to use. And every, everybody felt very comfortable with it and just loved it. So. That's what I awesome. I, I think about that right away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Have you heard at all from anybody from the Michael Buble camp or anything? Or do you know that he's aware of the show? Or um, is that come I, up? I would think he would be aware of it by this point. Um, mm-hmm. We get that question a lot. And my answer is that, especially cruising, you know, we've done a lot of Alaska runs out of Vancouver. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, we've, we've met, uh, at least, you know, we believe people when they tell us that they know him. So we've met his uncle, we've met his <laughs> publicist mom, we've met the people where that own the dock where he parks his yacht, we've met, uh, you know, his childhood babysitter, like a million people have told us that they have a personal relationship with him, but never, never, we've never gotten any kind of uh, message from him or tweet or anything like that. But um, we also haven't really tried too hard, you know, like I I don't, we don't like tag him in every single picture and video and all that, but um, maybe we should try. I don't know. I don't know if that would be good or bad. (laughs) I I think you would... He'd love really it. dig dig what you guys were doing. Oh, cool! Because uh, it's not someone tr- like I said. It's not someone trying to be him right, and right. imitating it. You're really kind of. I th- yeah. I think any artist who who has someone who's putting on a show about them, um, love it. especially if it's done well, you got to feel good about that. I mean, yeah. I, I, don't know. I, I, I hope he does. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, there are some tribute acts out there that I think um, don't really pay homage to <laughs> the <laughs> artists too. Well. Oh, man. <laughs> They're out well, there. I think the way you're doing it too, he'd really like, because you're not, as Darren says, you're not imitating him. You're out there celebrating his music in your own style. Right. And that's, right. you can't go wrong with something like that ever. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely a, an awesome concept. And it's made, you know, I was, I was always a fan of Michael Buble. Like I wasn't, I wasn't obsessed. I didn't have every single album, but uh, it's really made me 
appreciate a lot of his uh the arrangements he uh has done of certain songs you know they a lot of them have a little bit of different spin on it um which is always pretty interesting so I, i'm sure you get probably a lot of michael buble fans uh that follow him come out what what are their reactions to the show they usually really enjoy it the o- the only people well I'll, I'll talk about the ones that enjoy it like Usually, you, you know, talk well, about the other ones. <laughs> well, 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 that's, that's a quick, that's a quick statement. Like sometimes they'll hear our album on online or they'll randomly buy it off of Amazon or somewhere. And, you know, a few of those people will say, this is not at all what I was expecting it to be. But the people that come see the show in person yeah. are usually very supportive. Um, it is an interesting thing because, when people when we do a show on land versus a cruise ship you get people that know the name they want to be there they're coming because they love michael buble or maybe they know it's a three guy group and they like to hear harmony so those audiences are always very supportive the cruise ship audiences that's they didn't pick what show was happening that night you know so usually yeah. we have to, we have to do a bit more work to win them over but you always hear the fans the Michael Buble fans in the audience immediately they'll respond to all the songs. So I think they're just uh, pumped to be able to hear some of his stuff and always really enjoy it. Yeah. It's At least that's what we've heard to our, to our face. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. It's, it's a great cruise ship act. I mean, it fits in uh, very well. I think Michael Buble kind of sits in that market where it's, it's not, uh, it's not country, it's not pop, it's not, it's very mm-hmm. middle of the road. It's, it's, I think it's the type of music that anyone could sit through and really enjoy. And, and as I said, you put a real show element to it. There's it's visually uh, fun to watch and it's not just one guy, it's three guys. And right. um, so, yeah, no, well done. How, how are the age of the fans when you're on land? Are they the same uh, skew as Michael gets anywhere from a teenager right on up? Is it everybody? It honestly is. Um, we we get the really enthusiastic teenagers that are in their school chorus and do theater that just love Michael Bublé and they come and they're always so excited when we talk to them after. We get the, uh, the young people, men and women. Um, you know, there's a lot of women that love Michael Bublé. So of course we get the I think like the thirties age range, the those are pretty enthusiastic fan Michael Bublé fans. So we get a lot a lot of that. But then, you know, the older people come and enjoy the all the classics we do as well. So I think because he has, like you said, such a wide range of fans and styles, we also get a wide range of uh, ages and people that love the show. Very good. So what is it like now with COVID going on and all that? Obviously, there's no shows happening. Uh, how's, how's that affected uh, your life in general? Uh, there's been some, some positives in addition to the many negatives. Um, we were out on the road. Like, like I said earlier, uh, we were doing a show and a little mini Ohio tour. We managed to get the first show done that was debatable whether that one was going to happen. But then we knew immediately that the rest of the, the, that tour was canceled. And um, we didn't know how long the break was going to be like everybody else. You know, we, I I remember I I posted our last picture on social media saying, we don't know when we're going to get to perform again. So we tried to enjoy the show tonight. So, um, you know, after that point, the, the cancellations and the, a lot of people have postponed. We've only got, you know, to who knows when we're going to be able to get going again. So everybody's just postponed. We don't have a lot of those dates reset yet, but um, those just started rolling in. And we had uh, surprisingly, or maybe it's, you would probably know more about this, how a group develops over time, but we just had our fifth anniversary. Our, our fourth year was our busiest yet. And our fifth year, or is it fifth and sixth? Our fifth year was our busiest yet. Um, the upcoming year was schedule was just packed. So just to see several a day just start 
flying off my calendar was kind of uh, discouraging, you know. Um, the positives are that um, because we have been so busy and I've been traveling so much for five years, I never know what day it is or what state or country sometimes I'm in, waking up in and just <laughs> exhausted from always living on airplanes. That side of things, I've really enjoyed just a couple of months to kind of decompress and uh, spend time with some close family. I was, you know, isolated at first with my sister and we never get to, we're very close and we never get to spend that amount of time together. So those elements have been nice, but um, now that States are opening back up and everybody else is kind of going back to work, it's like, we're not really getting to do that yet because of the, being in mass gatherings and the crowds and, you know, they're saying singing is bad because of the aerosol and all this and that. So um, that's a little sad that we don't know when it's going to get, get going again. But um, I'm in the meantime, just doing all I can and not really performing a lot at home. I haven't really sung much. I'm not, I'm not a big sing in my living room type person, but um <laughs> I appreciate the ones that do. I'm watching those. so <laughs> <laughs> It's a real shock to the system, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brian and I have talked a lot what it's going to be like when we restart again. And and yeah. we've mentioned that people that are in your position are in a really good position because you're not out on the road with with three buses and exactly. you know, eight mm -hmm. transport trucks and all right. that. You, right. you, guys, you guys can slim in there pretty mm -hmm. low key. And because when you came up here, you just did your shows with tracks mm -hmm. um, and you have that capability and you can do your show with a band. Right. Uh, but but you can slide in as a three piece very safely to a lot of venues. And that's going to be really in your favor. And that's going to be really shows like yours are the ones that are going to really do well, especially at the beginning uh, to get get things rolling because they'll feel safe with a show like yours. I hope so. Yeah. We, you know, there's already been some interest for outside concerts with track. Uh, you know, we've heard people are trying to do like some drive up that festival type thing. So we'll see. I'm, I'm, uh, trying to stay positive that we'll get to, uh, and usually three of us are together so much anyway, we're gonna, um, we're all in it together and can just stay separated from the audience and you know everybody else so it, we share everything so basically so it, it's going to be the key formula to coming back trust me i watched this yeah. thing 17 hours a day for three months and it's that's what's going to work because i think that um yeah i watched the nashville scene opened up last week and it was two mm. people on the stage and 60 people in the audience and they'll build to three and so on and so forth so we'll it you know that's and God knows how long that will go, and I think that's that's Darren and I have talked about this many many times. Those people that can do that, a lot of people can't. And the fact they've been able to do it before, you're ready to go. You don't have to wait. And somebody says, "Let's go," you're you're ready. And that's, I'm ready. That's a good thing. Good. We are ready. too. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I I really I just want to take a minute to say I I I really feel for you guys that you had to cancel your season. I. I'm not just saying this. We always talk about our experience at your theater it was one of our all time favorite gigs. People ask us. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. People ask us all the time. What's one of your favorite places you've been or done. And we always talk about that trip. It was just so nice, just beautiful, nice people, uh, high production value. A couple of days off here and there we went to the stratford festival saw a show you know it's just it's truly was one of our our favorite experiences ever so thank you for that awesome. and i yes. hope i hope you guys are able to uh come back stronger than ever we're all in this so together <laughs> <laughs> we <Yeah>. are. <laughs> and brian's mentioned and it's a very good point it's it's really all starting over again mm -hmm. and we're all at an equal playing field exactly. and, and there's lots of resets going on. Um, there's going to be some venues that aren't going to make it. Mm. Uh, there's going to be lots of things get sorted out over the next few months. Um, some unfortunate, not 
great for some venues, but there's a lot of stuff out there that's going on that shouldn't be going on. That's, I think it's going to probably get fixed and, Mm -hmm. and it's going to be different for everybody, you know? It's such a weird thing, you know, anytime somebody's down or there's a crisis in the world, entertainment skyrockets. That's everybody wants to go out and be entertained. Right. And now right. now we're the first ones to have to stop. We're the mm-hmm. last ones to finish. And the audience wants it so bad. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you know, you know exactly. But uh, they, they, they really want it. So we have to make sure we get back and give it to them. Yes. That's what we Agreed. have to do. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it will, it will bounce back uh, really well. And as we mentioned, I think a group like yours will will be the ones people are looking for and theaters are looking forward to getting because it's it's a simple thing mm-hmm. for them to you know compare to the big big shows exactly yeah and those are stressful for for everybody i've been looking a lot of broadway stuff and mm. i know you're in new york and you've done a lot of that stuff uh, getting 200 people backstage is going to be very exactly, difficult yeah. Mm. yeah let alone financially making that work Right, it's there's right. so much extra extra work plus not having a full audience plus all these extra things that have to be done. Yeah. I you know, I think you're gonna be in a really great position. You just Thank have you. to market it correctly that you know that's and you, you guys do yeah, that stuff up really, really, really well. So great. Uh, you should should be good. Awesome. Uh, we we haven't really have talked about this, but you're do you now own the show? I do. I as of uh, I think one of the first days of December, I exclusively own the rights to the show. So um, that was a crazy kind of unexpected thing. Our, uh, the creators of the show and original producers of the show are still our managers. Um, and they're now managing, I think, 15 other groups or something. So. Um, they were kind of busy with that and more to be more prefer to uh, create new shows and manage shows than do all the uh, kind of producing work. Um, so they offered it to me and um, it was not something I had really worked for other than committing a hundred percent to the group, you know, for the past few years and doing my best at that. So I, I was very surprised but honored that they asked me to take care of this wonderful thing that they created. And um, I said, yes, and started my own company. And now I'm in in charge of everything except for the bookings themselves. I mean, I decide, you know, I say yes or no, but they're the ones, the managers are the ones in contact with the presenters and theaters. And they'll let me know what the deal is and I'll, I'll sign the contract. Awesome. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's a lot of work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Especially we were it all happened. I was thrown into the deep end because we were so busy over Christmas and um through January and February. I, I think I was at home at my apartment in New York three days between like December fifteenth and um a shutdown. So I um it was a lot of having to do work on in airports and hotel rooms and figure it all out as I go. But, uh, that's another positive after the break, I'll be set, you know, um, when we come back, I'll be, I won't be, uh, quite in as much over my head as I was for a couple months there. You you probably have some airline points to use up to. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness we have, I had tons of flights bought that we had to end up canceling and they, I got the credit back for all of those in addition to lots of points from uh, our busy season as well. So that should be a a good thing for a little while. Where do the other two guys live? Everyone is based in New York that does the, yeah, does the show. Um, People are kind of scattered right now. I think as many people as possible tried to, uh, piece out of the city when all this started but um it's just easier to have everybody located in new york because we we rehearse and even though we've done the show hundreds of times we anytime we go out we have a little brush up rehearsal just to keep everything tight Tight. running running smoothly and all um we've checked in a few times done some you know virtual q a type things but uh 
Otherwise, everybody's just enjoying a little break right now. How many guys do you have available to do the show? So people ask a lot, like I saw, you know, you had a group in Australia and you were also on a cruise ship. So I think people think there's set multiple set groups of the show. And it's, it's more, um, we more just have probably seven or eight guys that can rotate in and out of the, the three spots based on who's available. Because the idea was that we would, uh, no one would have to commit a hundred percent to this so we could pursue our individual careers, whether it be a music or a theater. Um, so that's worked out pretty well. Um, usually it's the same. There's usually two or, th- or three of us that are kind of there for a, a season. And um, if somebody can't do one job, another guy can slip right in. I actually do all three of the parts. Um, started out as one and have gradually learned the other two over the years just to be available to um, do it. So that's the that's the long answer. <laughs> How do things go in Australia? Uh, very well. There were there were some um, a few challenges because, like Darren said earlier, the show is is fully choreographed. Um, our other creator, whose name I haven't mentioned yet, Melissa Giatino, she and Ron Stefano did all the choreography together. But she was, you know, they were both. Broadway dancer. She was the dance captain for 42nd Street Revival on Broadway. Um, so it, it's, I don't want to say like tons of dancing because it's not dancing, but uh, it's fully staged. So right. we had we had some interesting stages over there. We're used to, um, we, we play some small places, but you'll have, even in like a little country club or something, you have a, a small kind of rectangle or square stage. But here we They were playing on like tents and all these festivals and stuff. So there would be like little small circle platforms connected by uh, (laughs) walkways and stuff. (laughs) I mean, the pictures looked awesome. You know, it was like, oh, this is something we haven't seen before with the group. But um, uh, definitely had to get creative with some staging stuff and let a few of the... uh, few of the details of you know positions just kind of go <laughs> and do do the best we could but audiences were wonderful they loved it you know it was i guess Jan- was it january when all the the crazy fires were happening in australia so we didn't know what that was going to be like but then got there and everything was okay but then um i think they made it all the way to the last 10 days, I think, before they had to just cancel and come home a little early. But um, it was very, very successful. Hopefully we can do something like that again. Let's go back a little bit. Okay. Um, are you actually a New York guy or were you? I, I grew up in Georgia in a very small town of 3,000 people. Um, the city is called Soperton. Um, If you've ever heard of Vidalia Onions, a lot of people have heard of that. That's I'm about 15 minutes from there. We can uh, grow them. Um, So that that's the closest thing. It's uh, I ended up in New York City after living in a tiny town of 3000 people. So that that's kind of unusual. But um, yeah, I singing singing at a young age, very young. Um, We didn't have typical opportunities, um, especially because I did eventually discover that I wanted to go into theater. Um, we didn't have theater at programs at my school. We didn't have a choir chorus program. Um, so I grew up singing in church, started singing when I was four. I did like a kid's musical. So I would always do the Christmas programs and stuff like that. And then sing in the choir, um, when I was in high school. But um, I started studying voice with a teacher at a a neighboring town, um, and she just helped me tremendously, um, and then ended up going to college in Birmingham, Alabama, and getting a degree in classical voice, Um, and I was a theater minor for a while, and then after I graduated from college, that's when I moved to New York City about a month later, um, 
And I went to a conservatory there for four semesters as well for musical theater. And I've been in New York for 14 years. So it's been a while, but that, okay. that's kind of the, the fast Excellent. version of my story. Oh, very good. What yeah. was it like getting to New York and what what is it like auditioning and, and going f- and spending your life getting those roles and those parts and, and a lot of those shows? So it was very different at first than I realized. Um, I think when I was in college, you know, again, coming from sm- such a small town, my, my family was so supportive. We took trips to New York a few times growing up to see shows. We had uh, season tickets uh, to the Fox Theater in Atlanta to see all the tours that came through. Um, so I had been exposed to a lot, thankfully, but I didn't know about the college musical theater programs and all the stuff. You know, kids start working towards their Broadway careers when they're teenagers or younger. And I didn't even get to be in a musical till I was 19 off at college. Um, so I, I was kind of working from behind. But um, once I got to New York, I realized auditioning. I always imagined, you know, you walk in a room and you you sing better than everybody else that day and you get the job and it works nothing like that. <laughs> um, that's Not just a, <laughs> a tiny part of it, you know, um, is how well you do with your, you know, scenes or song in the room. Um, and it's a huge part about meeting the right people. And thankfully with our actors union, we can all go to the auditions for Broadway shows, but you know, a lot of times by the time those auditions happen, there's already been six readings of a new musical, two workshops, and they're already have their cast set for the out of town tryout, you know, so you, it, it's better to get involved um, early on in the process of stuff like that. But, you know, I managed to do gets, get a lot of goals accomplished eventually. Um, What was the first show you got? The very first show I did was a a little stage reading in the city, which is really exciting because I didn't work in college. I didn't do summer stock and internships in the summertime like a lot of kids do. Um, So I did a musical called The Boyfriend, and that was that was really fun. Um, I've done pretty much all. I don't think I've ever been in a musical that set after the 1960s i'm always cast in like the classic type show so i've done you know like mm-hmm. fairly modern millie white christmas all the period kind of pieces but um i did finally i guess it was 10 years ago at this point i got my equity card and got a little summer tour of the sound of music not little tour i mean we played huge houses but it was a short summer tour of the sound of music and i got to play the fox in atlanta where i grew up Oh, nice. seeing yeah. shows you know so that was just mm-hmm. such a cool kind of full circle moment um so i've had some success but then you know theater stuff that a lot of the jobs are very short and the, the broadway shows are hard to come by especially the ones that run for years and years um so i kind of discovered this concert world headlining circuit and i have just enjoyed doing that and having a steady job for the past five years i'm not done with theater i go to auditions when i can but the problem is i'm never the the blessing and the curse is that i'm working a lot with with shades of buble so i'm not in the city a lot to actually go to the auditions for broadway stuff but um so for people who don't know what the audition is like yes maybe explain what it's like that uh, the audition process and and maybe if you have a story that one of your auditions um because i think a lot of people will find that fascinating i yeah sh- short story for me I, I auditioned once for i think it was a tv commercial but it was in toronto and i got called in they were looking for a fiddle player uh for a tv show so i got called in of course i wasn't really thinking about it and you go in this room and and walked in and there's every other fiddle player I know in Ontario <laughs> sitting there <laughs> waiting to audition too. And I'm thinking, what are you guys doing here? And they, so you'd sit around and they all go in, you go in and they, mm-hmm. and there's a couple of people, you know, ask you a couple of questions and you, you played a little bit and they filmed you and, and, uh, it's like, all right, that was it. So I was like, ah, what a waste of time. <laughs> and so, so I drove home and they, I got a call back 
and they wanted to see me like the next day. And I think this is why we were doing shows at our theater, even like at the early, early days. And I was like, no, I said, you guys took video, did you not? He says, yeah. So like, well, we'll look at the video. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't changed it yesterday. <laughs> so I'm not going to, I'm not going to be much different than that. Obviously I didn't get the part, but it's just like, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I've never really thought of it like that. If you're on video, why, why go back? But, uh, yeah, they want to see people a lot. I will say that. Um, I think sometimes there's different types of auditions. So there's open calls or like our union required calls where basically you go in and you sing either 16 bars of a song or 32 bars of a song. So you're literally in the room for less than two minutes. Um, just enough time to, you know, give the accompanist your tempo and sing a song that you picked and you're out. Um, but then there's, so, let me oh, hold on for a second. Yeah. So it was a, a union required audition. Is that what you said? Yes. How does that work? So, yeah. Talk, talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So, understand. so they have every, uh, there's different types of contracts, but basically every union contract, they're required to have some form of audition that is not an agent call. Um, that way all of the member, the union members have access to be seen at these auditions now sometimes okay. it's just a casting associate in the room not that that's bad because you know you can make relationships with them um that become very important but if you know if it's a like a broadway chorus call i think someone from the creative team has to be in the room so even if the show's fully cast already from agent appointments or direct offers or whatever you at least get to to sing or do a monologue or a scene for someone from the creative team. Um, now, like I said, a lot of times uh, the director and mm, people that are kind of higher up in the chain, producers are at the agent calls, not the open calls. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get an appointment from your agent or you just want to be seen by the casting director, the open calls are just a great way to go see, but they're fast. It's, I, I think they see hundreds of people in a, a day. So you're just in and out, in and out, in and out. Is that a union obligation that they, that they sign a deal with the union? They have to see so many people or is there a limit to it or how does that work? It's depending on the size of the theater and the different types of union contracts they have to have a certain amount of days. So some shows, Broadway shows always have three days of the principal auditions, and then they'll have one day of the chorus singing auditions and one day of the dancing auditions. And, but then a small regional theater, I think, could just come to New York and audition one day, okay. everybody. Um, so it, it's all, you know, there's hundreds of those specific contracts for every type of theater wow. and theater size and it's all very complicated <laughs> it sounds like it to me <laughs> it's probably like the corporate world where you've got someone you you already have for the job mm -hmm. but legally you have to yes uh check out a bunch of other people just to say that you you did it yeah, exactly yeah and i i'm not discouraging or saying it's impossible you know or there's no reason to go to those calls. I, I've had callbacks for Broadway shows from going to one of the, the open calls, um, multiple actually. So it can happen. But typically, you know, you would have a, either an agent appointment or two of my biggest jobs I've ever had just came from people messaging me on Facebook and saying like, hey, are you available to do this? And then it turned into something you know, started out as a little reading and turned into a, a big project. Um, one was supposed to be in Toronto. I can't say uh, what it is on air in case it ever happens again, but um, that got postponed a few years ago. So we'll see. Maybe that'll happen eventually. That's another part, you know, shows get cast and then people lose funding or theaters or whatever. And it's it's a big business like anything else. It's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, working parts that uh, don't have a ton to do with the 
talent. So, (laughs) so I'm assuming that it's sort of like the radio business or anything else where in the old days where there's some money thrown underneath the table every once in a while, or you, you do this for me, I'll do that for you. Or, uh, I'm, I'm sure that happens a little bit. You can just nod. (laughs) 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 Uh, This is just audio. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, maybe. Yeah. I, not personally, but, um, they're, you know, I think they're trying to, as the years go on, um, eliminate things like that happening. But, um, yeah, you know, it's like anything else. There's going to be people that do everything by the book and then others who, who don't, but that's, that's the good thing about, I mean, honestly, I'm not a huge, I didn't grow up in like union part of the country. Really. I, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other about it. Um, I just, do it because that's what you have to do to, to get the best jobs in theater in New York, you know, but, um, yeah. but they, there are a lot of positives that they, they try to keep track of like every little thing like that to make sure everything's done um, by the book. So that's yeah. good. So you'll get open calls mm-hmm. and then you get agent calls, yes. which are basically uh, calls out to agents. Do you have somebody appropriate for this? Yes. Part? Could yes. you send, you know, is that, yeah. So there, there's is? a big online database, every show that happens, the casting director or producer, if they're doing casting themselves, puts a breakdown for the show. So say you're doing Les Mis, you would put the breakdown character description, agents see that they think, they think through their clients who would best fit it and they submit them casting then decides if they want to bring that person in or not for an audition. So, you know, you have thousands of actors being submitted for every single show. Um, yeah. And again, one every like 10 minutes throughout the day, however many people that is gets an audition, you know? So um, hmm. that's, that's another reason why it's important. Cause if a casting director doesn't recognize your name, they, they're not going to call you in. That's why it's good to me make connections where you can. But, um, so that happens. They'll send you usually if it's a musical, they'll send you a song or two from the show. If it's a big role, I I had a several auditions for a national tour of a Broadway musical a few years ago. And they sent me, I think it was like 45 or 50 pages of material to learn for the auditions. I had to do five full songs five or six different scenes. So like you basically learn the role, uh, you know, when you go in for these auditions, sometimes you'll learn the full packet and they'll have you do one song and say, come back some other day. But that, like you said about showing up and every fiddle player you knew was there, like it's kind of the same in theater because you have a type that you're seen as, whether you think you can do a big range of roles or not, you're basically always seen as one thing. So you show up with the same guys or the same girls at every audition because you're the ones that get called in for the same roles, you know. So it, it's kind of a, a very small role in a uh, world in that way. Um, but yeah, they can call you back. I had some auditions for a, a new Broadway musical a few years ago. I was in, I believe, six times altogether before they realized. I wasn't going to be in it. You know, I'm like six times. You, you didn't know after like the second time if I was going to work or not, you know? Um, so it's kind of, a, it's draining in that way. Cause the, those kind of long processes can last over a period of, of weeks. And you just, you know, you want to know when you're, when your dream is on the line, if it's happening or not. And then, you know, you'll nail it. And then they'll say, okay, well, can you come back? next week and the next week or the next day and it just goes on and on and um that's that's difficult yeah you, and you could be putting off other work thinking that this is looking really good exactly uh-huh. yeah 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 um and that's that's the other thing is you don't know what to go do and what not to do because sometimes you'll really feel like you're going to get a job and you kind of have to say no to 
couple of things while you're waiting on that and if that offer doesn't come through then you're just you know stuck with nothing but um it's Mm. all it's all very very tricky (laughs) one question i had because i i'm not from that world all auditions do they happen roughly in the same area of town or is there like a a building you go to a lot of times this is where everyone goes to get auditions or could it be anywhere yes um they're they're all typically just south of the theater district. There's maybe one or two offices that are above, I think, the southernmost Broadway theaters on 41st Street. Um, there's one casting office who has their own audition rooms. Um, usually casting directors rent rehearsal studios. So those are all a little bit south. But I would say between 35th Street and 43rd Street are where on 8th Avenue or where 98% of the auditions happen. Um, there's a couple of uptown as well that just closed um, on 54th Street. And I think back in the day, like 57th Street, 54th Street were kind of in the areas for that. But now we have 8th Avenue between 34th and 36th. There's two or three very large studios that have multiple floors of buildings. Um, that are just all you can hold rehearsals in there. You can rent it for an audition. So it's, it's kind of a uh, walk down that part of eighth Avenue any weekday and you'll hear the people warming up and rehearsing their monologues and lip trilling and all the other crazy stuff that actors and singers do to get ready for auditions. <laughs> we'll have to have to do that. I'd next like time to see that too. <laughs> yeah, you should. I mean, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but I mean, there's nothing, you know, look up Pearl Studios, Ripley Greer. There's nothing stopping anybody from just walking in those places because it's it's a turnover of thousands of people every day. Um, But typically the, the busiest audition season, they call it, when like all the regional theaters come to New York to hold their season auditions is between January and April. Yeah. So it's crazy in the in those buildings. I mean, you can't even find a seat. Everybody's just packed into those holding rooms. The hallways are insane. So I, I prefer when I book a job during audition season and don't have to be there for all of all of that. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty wild. Getting the Shades of Buble gig must just have been. I guess it's almost like a dream to some extent where you're, you're keeping really busy, but you're not having to go through that process of auditioning all the time. And you're basically a lead in the show and, and you get to play roughly all the same type of venues you would if you were traveling, yeah, uh, doing any of those other types of shows. It It is. I think, um, you know, my, my dream or goal, I guess, career goal kind of has shifted over the past 15 years. Um, just to, to work consistently versus a specific thing. Um, I mean, I still would, you know, love to book a huge Broadway show that gets a lot of attention, that that would be a lot of fun. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm so thankful to be busy doing what I love, even if it doesn't quite look like I imagined it 15 years ago when I was first starting. Um, it's a it's a job a lot of people would really appreciate. Um, so yeah, I'm very thankful. I think any time that you can do what you love and make a living from it and being able to do it consistently, you can't ask for much more than that. Even though yeah, uh, it may not be your dream Broadway show or whatever, but and even getting those gigs sometimes they don't last very long right. they're done and right and then you've or you've done that part for so long that okay you finish up and okay what am i going to do now and you sit stale for months or years at a time right it's good while it's gone but a lot of those gigs don't last very long true and you know i've had periods of my career where you you know the the big thing with new york agents is they they want you to stay in the city like you got to stay here to get all these auditions and most theater work and performing work is leaving the city except for being in a Broadway show, you know? So, um, I just got to a point where, you know, I I had periods where I committed to that and 
you have to get random jobs that are flexible that allow you to audition and I just got tired of that I was like if I if I can be performing I don't care if it takes a few years longer to book the biggest show you know I'd I'd rather just be out doing what I feel I was created to do um, and enjoying life than just to be miserable working some random job not that there's anything wrong with those jobs just for me personally I would I worked so hard to be a performer. I want to be a performer, you know, Mm. and this allows me to do that. So what was uh, your first cruise experience? Like Uh, had you, have you done, have you been on cruises before you performed on? So I had never taken a cruise in my life. It was 2012, I think. And I, I had had, I had never auditioned to do like a contract on a cruise ship people had asked me people like had saw seen videos of mine on youtube and messaged me like hey do you want to work on this cruise line you'll get to travel for nine months and you know make this amount of money i always like was like no i'm not doing that that is the perception of cruise performance has changed a little bit i think people have realized how cool it is and it's a great way to make money and travel the world um, but it, it wasn't as much like that, like 10 years ago, even. But um, uh, so I always said no. So finally, I think 2012, I had huge opportunities that all fell through. A million final callbacks for stuff. Didn't book any of it. Um, and then they, my agent called me one day and said, these people, uh, this company, cruise, Six Star Cruise Line, Regent, seven seas uh is asking you to do a contract it's all brand new shows they finally offered a much higher number than they had in the past and it uh and that moment finally sounded good to me and i said yeah i want to go work and i did it and i did a nine month contract for the cruise line now what we do you know we don't really work for the cruise lines they hire us a week at a time and we fly on and off (laughs) But I did a full contract, um, made a couple of great friends, saved a ton of money, traveled, um, loved it. There were aspects of the contract I didn't love. You know, being on a ship for that long was very challenging. And I had never taken a cruise before in my life. So I, so they, (laughs) you know, we like, we fly, we rehearse in Florida for a month and they fly us to San Juan and to get to board the ship for the first time and i was thinking six star cruise line this is nice as it gets this is going to be incredible um they where we boarded or yeah we was like straight into the main crew hallway which on every ship is called the i-95 and they sent us straight into the crew mess now like the downstairs areas of cruise ships are not <laughs> like the upstairs area. So I, I was sitting there like tile floor, just, you know, steel walls, just white paint and, you know, didn't look new. Nothing looked extremely nice. And I was like, what have I gotten myself into? But then, you know, once we, and the ship was in wet dock. So, which means like they were basically spending three days at sea to replace all the carpet, completely re- redoing the theater. Um, so it was kind of a mess for the first few days, but then I fell in love with it. And my goal became after that point to get it into guest entertaining. Um, so this was kind of the first shades was my first opportunity to do that. So then, you know, three years later to be able to step on, a ship and board with the passengers and be full guest status and know I was just going to be there for a week with no other duties and get to eat in the dining room and all that kind of fun stuff just felt really, really awesome. Yeah. It's a way better deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the money is great. Better. You know, when you're there for nine months, like, you can sublet it out your apartment in New York and save a ton. So the, you know, the consistent check for that long was nice. But, um, 
as an experience, it's much nicer to go on as a as a guest entertainer. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Did you have to do yeah. much else when you're on the region cruise? Did you do have to do other stuff like some ships? You see the entertainers playing bingo, or they're doing something else. And were you pretty yeah. limited to the singing part, or what else did you have to do? Well, that's what's interesting about the the little six star lines is they're so small that they they don't have a big cruise staff. So if you, I'm just going to say this is I'm not saying this uh, in a derogatory way to any of the lines. Yeah. Yeah. But like if you go on Royal Caribbean or Celebrity or something like that, they have a staff of people to do all of the games and stuff like that. But with the small ship, we had 490 Mm -hmm. passengers. So you don't have enough room and crew area to have Mm -hmm. all these entertainment staff so the I, the dancers mm-hmm. would have to do the games i had to do other types of duties like um i had to socialize at like cocktail hour and tea time and all the, i would just kind of have to circulate <laughs> which is like not my thing i love i love meeting people and talking if it kind of happens organically but just to walk up to a table of people and be like hey how was your day that's that's like <laughs> not me at all and, and then on Embark Day, I would have to stand at the gangway for a certain amount of time and kind of greet people as they walked on, which I tried to find out as much of that stuff ahead of time as I could, and some things still fell through the cracks. So I, I was pretty shocked when I got there and found out I, I wasn't just going to be mm. uh, singing. But, <laughs> you know, I got to – I also, positive, I got to do my – I got to create and – perform a solo show and on the main stage uh, most of the cruises um which was great because you learn a lot immediately doing that about that type of audience versus you know like a new york cabaret audience and um so that was a wonderful learning experience as well um but yeah i i would recommend it i might choose a different line if i had to go back and do it again but um so what's good. your uh probably your favorite place that you've traveled Ooh. or even even with your regular travels okay so i'm a big beach person so a, a lot of people don't love the, the caribbean cruises which i don't understand because i i love it i think it's stunning but um i love so down there i love saint lucia there's a tour i do I think some of the islands, it just depends on where you go. There's a tour I do there um, that I, it's one of my favorite places. Sugar Beach is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I got to do a French Polynesian, uh, like Bora Bora, Tahiti cruise that was just incredible. Um, But then also I got to go over to Amsterdam and do a cruise there. And Amsterdam is probably one of my favorite places I've gotten to see. So I, I think I would, yeah, Amen. Brian likes Amsterdam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do. <laughs> awesome. I, I've got. Yeah. I've been twice now, yeah. and both times it, I just had like the best day there. So um, that's, I guess, my favorite. So you have, yeah, really great. Yeah. Uh, Good you have a, There's a new show now too, right? <laughs> there is. Yeah, I, I actually own uh, the rights to a show called NYC Three. Um, which is very different than Shades of Buble. Um, it's predominantly music from the past 10 years, There's, um, but with the same style. So there's still harmony and three guys, so, lots of solos. Um, but it's, it's stuff that major radio hits from the past 10 years. We have a couple of classics in there as well. Hallelujah. Um, I want to dance with somebody at the end, but um, it's a lot of like Justin Timberlake, Ed Sheeran, um, Bruno Mars type stuff, um, which is really fun. I did not know how it was going to go over and it has been amazing. Even with our, our older, we do a lot of private country club type shows in Florida in the winter time and they have been eating it up. I think everybody was just excited to hear something different and new. Different. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah. it's, it's been very, very fun. Um, so yeah, I, now I can flip flop between the two, between the two shows when I want, um, which is fun because it keeps it 
exciting and interesting to do some new different material. When you go on a cruise, will you be, can you do both shows or they usually go on and just do one of the two? We are booked separately. So yeah, uh, a couple of the guys, there's probably like three or four of us that know both shows. Um, I think we would have to, I don't know that we could go on as, maybe we could go on as NYC3 and then do a second night of like classics, but I, I don't think we could call it Shades of Buble. Maybe we could. I don't know. We've talked about it. Cruise directors, everybody's mentioned it because they know we're the same. They know I own both shows, you know? So, um, yeah, it's definitely something to think about. Um, especially if things, if the, I guess, kind of logistics change with cruising because a lot of cruise lines will have us come on for the last part of one cruise and the first few days of another so that you do your, you do your first act for two different audiences. Other cruise lines, we do our first act one night, our second night, our second act another night. But um, if everybody starts doing more of that thing and we need a second show and they wanted some variety, then that might be a great way to say, Hey, look, we can do these totally completely different styles um, and offer, you know, your audiences some different stuff. So we'll see. Everything might change in the next, in the next year. We're all going to have to get creative. I think. Oh boy. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see cruise wise what's going to happen just in general, but especially for the entertainment, it's, I mean, it's going to probably be, be different there. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone knows at all, but I I can't see that just ramping right back up again. Um, Right. You know, it's, you know, it's interesting. I've been watching, the cruise mapper, I have it on one of my pages on my, my phone. And every night when I'm just kind of scrolling through stuff like Facebook and that, I pop the cruise mapper up and I find it fascinating to see where all the ships are going. Uh-huh. And Cause there's a whole bunch of them that are heading down South the bottom end of Africa and heading up to, uh, to Asia and dropping off all uh, the staff. Right. Uh, right. Cause they can't fly them home. Oh my gosh. Whole, yeah bunch going to Europe and there's, so you see all these cruise ships out, you know, there's a lot of them going the same direction, but there's nobody on them yeah. <laughs> besides crew. Um, just logistically, it just must be a, a nightmare. It's, yeah. It's been, I have a lot of friends, you know, that I've met over the past few years and they're, I think they're on day like 75 to 80, somewhere in that range of being at sea. And some of them have just gotten to go home in the past two days. And I have some that are still on the ships, but it's like you say they're. I think the ships are, a lot of them are staying together. So you'll see, you know, they'll post social media stuff and you'll see like seven or eight other ships all just kind of hanging out in the area together. And then they, yeah. I think they go to port once a week to get food and stuff and then have to go right back out to sea, which is just, um, it's been wild and they had flights canceled. I know the Canadians were going to be the first ones to finally get to go home. They all transferred to one specific ship um, <laughs> with a one particular line uh, company, I should say. And they got there the day they were supposed to leave. Something happened with the flight or somebody said no, you know, whatever port they were going into changed their mind and said no. So then the Canadians, the first ones supposed to leave, ended up just getting home like, four or five days ago um which is just it's all been wild Uh, the british people are getting home a lot of the americans are home but i definitely have some filipino friends that haven't made it home yet ukrainian friends haven't made it home so um it's a wild time uh thankful i thankful i wasn't stuck out there when all Mm. that happened yeah because i heard some entertainers have been Mm -hmm. on quite a bit too Mm -hmm. just hanging out yes i got off um the cruise before everything shut down um so that was a a blessing because a few guest entertainers did get stuck on a couple of the ships that weren't allowed to come back into port um so it was bad yeah scary yeah (laughs) well i won't take a whole lot more of your time i'm just going to wrap up a couple more questions um one question i always like to ask uh all my guests is if you uh, have a favorite place 
uh, in the world that you've always wanted to perform, uh, but haven't yet had the chance to perform, what would that be? So my, besides, because I haven't booked a <laughs> Broadway show yet, that, that of course, any Broadway show would be my number one. I did get to do a big tour and play the Fox in Atlanta. That would have been another choice. But I think now I, I would love to play Vegas. I think that would be super cool. I've never performed there or anywhere near that area, but I, I just, I love the kind of history and legacy there and think it would just be awesome to be able to say, I, you know, performed in one of the big casinos or theaters out there. Well, don't count on it for this. Summer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey, they're doing Brian, that, they're doing shows in Branson. I did a uh, season there, and right. so we'll uh, we'll see. <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'll go back there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the ramp. Is, some places are slowly starting to open a little bit, but we'll have to see whether they actually can sustain yeah. or, or not. So I think they're all little testing grounds for everybody yeah. to see what what happens. And Brian, Brian, and I are both Vegas fans brian more than me but um yeah it's it <laughs> i think having a show there would be be pretty neat yeah i i, I really hope that that after all this that a lot of the smaller shows come back in mm -hmm. like the lounge shows and all that stuff yeah i really miss all that stuff from from years ago what do you think about that brian Plus you get, on. it just yep. so, they're so they just trying to outdo each other mm -hmm. and and you just miss sitting in a small lounge watching a really great singer. I've seen some of the greatest shows in there. As a matter of fact, uh, I was just out there, I don't know, let's say February, whatever the heck it was. Wow. And Dion Warwick is doing a show out there in a 180 seat theater. And it's absolutely, it's, it's a club, it's beautiful. And it took me back to those days that Darren's talking about. You could see people like that performing yeah. in those lounges all the time. You still can go to the Bellagio. There's a great little spot there by the garden. It's a, couple of people always in there every day and they're that's fabulous cool. you know, and cool. you can see anything so i agree with you i yeah, like that for me that's the type of gig mm -hmm. I'd, I'd want to do nothing that's you know seven nights a week but uh something you could slip into a really funky cool spot and just perform mm -hmm. and, and and have fun definitely um, that would yeah uh yeah. so looking ahead over the next kind of five ten years do you have any plans on on where you'd like to be hopefully by then i i can't see myself unless my theater career took back off and i just started working nonstop in new york i would want to stay there you know of course and ride that wave while it was happening but um i like i really love florida so i i think i'd want to end up i have a solo show that I've done and booked in the past. I, I'm trying to get that going again. Um, so I think it would just be really fun to have, you know, step away from the, the group shows down the road, let other people do those and just do my own thing and be able to live in the palm trees and do all the stuff I like to do that you can't <laughs> do in New York City. <laughs> um, but we'll see, you know, that, that's a long term long-term goal. I think that question has changed now for a lot of people where you, you had ideas maybe five years from now, but now you're like with everything that's going on, it's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I hope. That's yeah. A I, question to answer. Again, I, I just, the, the main thing would be whatever it looks like. I just hope to still be busy uh, performing and doing what I love by that point. So. That's good. Well, like Brian and I mentioned, I think you're in a good spot. The show that you're doing is, uh, uh, yeah, bet. it's the second one sounds good too. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've seen the promo for it. It looks pretty really great. It's fun. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to wrap it up, um, here on the podcast. We appreciate you hanging out with us. Um, thanks so I'll much. It's my first up, podcast yeah. ever. Really? Yes. Sorry. We disappointed <laughs> well, there you. For go. you. <laughs> there you go we set, we set the bar yeah. now that's good it's all downhill awesome. excellent <laughs> there you go thanks thank Drew you. it's been a lot of fun yeah, I enjoyed it very much guys. <laughs>